Head on. Okay. Great, Kirsten, thanks. Uh, thanks everybody for joining, sticking around. I hope everybody's got hot pockets or a healthy alternative in front of them and uh, can stick it out with us. My name's Rich Toussaint. I am the federal civilian sales lead, empty suit. Uh, I'm joined by the brains of the outfit, Scott Wilson. We're gonna put the cart in front of the horse a little bit and kind of go through what ATARC laid out they wanted to see in terms of, of fit for zero trust. Um, we're with a company called Forward Networks. And um, so let's kind of go ahead and get into talking about where we are in zero trust strategy or how we see ourselves fitting in with uh, how ATARC laid it, laid it out. Functional areas for us, um, because you know everybody's a zero trust vendor, we want to be very specific about where we fit uh, in the items that they've laid out. Very clearly for us, visibility and analytics. Discovering how your network is oriented, uh, monitoring and auditing those devices and uh, that, all that hardware and software out there across the network, whether it's physical or virtual. And then we provide direct integrations into the network environment areas, the visibility and analytics, again, with external capabilities. Automation and orchestration, which is very important for us as, as automation sometimes um, brings vulnerabilities into the network. Uh, and then governance and scoring in terms of, of risk management. Next slide. Okay, so again, there's this EO, right, that everybody's been given you have 30, 60, maybe 90 days to go out and figure out how you're going to implement zero trust. We wanted to be, again, very specifically with the areas in the NIST guidance that we respond to. I'm no fan of huge, bold statements by companies, but I, I will make one on behalf of Ford. And that is there is one item in the 207 guidance that we really see as key for us. It's, it's the one that we feel that there's really nobody else out there doing this can do. And that is quite simply ensure that your traffic is not able to get around your PEPs, right? Additionally, I talked a little bit about um, identifying the assets, showing you what's on your network, whether it's physical or virtual. And then finally, identifying those key processes, those data flows. So very interestingly, you know, the, the conversation we have is it's not necessarily what's going on on your network. It's what's possible on your network. Our technology allows you to see every possible path a packet could take. Next slide. So where are we, right? What, nobody likes being the guinea pig, the, the, the first to deploy this type of technology. We've been out of stealth mode for coming up on five years now, around as a company for about nine. Uh, we were started by four PhD Stanford um, candidates. And we benefited heavily early on in terms of the technology through our relationship with Inkytel. Inkytel being an incubator, if you will, for government agencies and organizations to get their wants, needs, would like to have in a promising technology. Uh, it was both DHS, a member of the Intel community, and the uh, Department of Defense that sort of, uh, sort of helped us mature the product and add some capabilities that they wanted to see. Lo and behold, they're, they're customers today over at CVP, which is our largest civilian customer. Uh, just recently, DHS HQ. Uh, we've got POCs going. I'll mention them simply because they're just getting off the ground, uh, both at CISA and at ICE. And then over on the DOD side, um, what I'll point out is we were initially a, a networking tool, right? We were this, this capability to see the truth of your network. So we kind of felt that we had more of a, a play in the networking space. What's happened, uh, what's transpired over the past year, and certainly with the emphasis on zero trust, we've seen this massive influx of users from the security space. Um, point in case is the United States Air Force, which is deploying our platform at their SOCs. Uh, additionally, that, that Intel customer and just recently the JCU inside of, inside of SOCOM. Next slide. So let's go ahead and build it out, right? Because this concept of digital twin, it sounds kind of nebulous, right? But the reality is we use digital twins daily. Every time you Google search, it's a digital twin of the network where you're going to find information. I always hassle my kids. They can't read a paper map because they're so used to Google Maps doing all of the work for them. Not only that, it'll show you, you know, all this ancillary information about the destination you're headed to. 
So we relate that to a digital twin. And the easiest way to think of us is we're completely non-invasive, we're software based. We go out and through SSH, we scrape all of the configuration and state data out of your physical or virtual layer two through four devices, return it, rehydrate that in software as a snapshot. And you know, take for instance, CBP, they're doing twice daily snapshots of their network with each shift change after 12 hours. And that provides them that insight into the network, whether it's mean time to resolution around a networking issue or more recently around, hey, how does this connect? Do I need to be worried about it? Or is this channel of communication even possible? It's incredibly important from a blast radius perspective because all of a sudden you're able to say, well, if something is compromised, what can it access and how can it access it? Next. I'll go ahead because this is going to get too confusing for me and allow Scott to talk to the architecture. <laughs> yeah. So architecturally, as Rich mentioned, we're going out there and we're collecting on those devices, most often via SSH, where we collect on the cloud API based and on some crypto devices via SNMP. And what we're doing is we're pulling all that configuration and state that Rich talked about, but we're going to the depths of the ocean, right? We're going up talking about all these protocols that we don't talk about at parties. We don't talk about them because they're very complex, very specific to vendors, but yet we go out there, we collect all that information, scrape it all back and perform that holistic network behavior analysis. When we complete that analysis, push it into a database and highly indexed, allowing users or API driven to access that information. We're doing that whole analysis in minutes on the network. And what that gives us are two key things. One is an ability to query all that normalized data. So we were talking about the, the vendors like Cisco, Arista, Palo Alto, and so on and so forth, all present that information back in a vendor specific way. We abstract that information and when it's in the database, allowing you to pull that information out. So for example, if there's an outage and you wanna see if that outage would impact you at any other possible place in the network, for example, a bit of code, a capital letter, lowercase letter that costs one of a heavily regulated customers of ours a massive amount of uh, cost and fines. They're able to root that out and find it via this query ability. But you can also use it for precision about data. So we've saved customers millions of dollars just from the fact that they now have a complete look at the network. They can see what's connected to what when they go out for recap and upgrades, they know exactly what needs to upgrade or able to provide the decision makers the information they need. And on the comprehensive path analysis side, we're looking at every possible path in the network. And when we, when I mentioned we computed all this network behavior analysis, we've computed all the possible paths on the network. So you can ask by UI or API, can a host A talk to host B? But you can also ask those open-ended questions that Rich was so bold about in the beginning, which is, am I able to communicate it around my pets? So again, and go ahead and build this slide out, Scott, so we can get into the, the hands-on stuff. You, you know, we, we became sort of this marriage counselor between the networking and security teams, even the apps teams. Security often would have to do these lengthy data calls. In the case of CBP, the comment was, you know, it used to take us 30 conversations in three days to figure out where an IP lives. They can get it in seconds now. Compliance issues, and we'll actually address, because we're asked to by ATARC, the 853 controls that we can help um, manage. But it's this inability at the, at the end of the day to ensure that network security posture, right? That the folks on the left are concerned with locking everything down and the folks on the right are concerned about how, what's the connectivity lights like. So that single source of, of, of truth for the network becomes incredibly important and you're allowing your teams to self-service themselves to go and investigate blast radius for the vulnerability teams to, to go see what CVEs are important without having to open a ticket with the networking team. I spoke earlier about automation, we'll just say, you know, we help keep that automation on the rails. Um, it's great to hand the keys over to Skynet if it knows what it's doing, but what if it breaks something or, you know, we're still presents a vulnerability into the environment. We can help you with the, the before and after differential 
of, of what's occurred after a change. Next slide. So again, I'll, I'll let Scott kind of talk to the controls because that was an item for ATAR. Yeah, so I wanted to hit a, a three different controls. One of them here starting off with was AC4, Information Flow Enforcement. And we see this commonly across the federal space where you have an ATO, risk management framework, where essentially you have some database that may need to connect to an application, you know, to something up in the cloud. In other words, there's an information flow that you'd like to have. And there's also a side of that is information flows you do not want to have. And we're able to enforce those or, and look at those and, I mean, verify those every time we collect. So we are able to see that something does exist. In other words, I have a, the flow from my on-prem up into the cloud, maybe even look at it through a specific point in the network, make sure it takes a preferred path. But also, multiple times a day, as Rich was mentioning, we were able to cl collect on the network, take that snapshot, and verify that there are no other paths out there. So as a point of fact, we have customers today that are doing exactly this. In other words, they're coming in, they're saying developers or application teams, the request flows, the compliance teams approves them. Sounds really familiar, right? We have that risk management framework. You have applications that need to communicate. Somebody has to approve that. And we step in with forward networks as we're able to analyze that path, see what needs to change to allow that flow and also what needs to change to limit that flow to exactly what is allowed. And as Rich mentioned, once that automation kicks off, and pushes those changes out, we're on the back side of that to continually check that and make sure it's verified. We'll apply another one here, uh, CA7 continuous monitoring. And this is that query engine that we have in the platform. And you're able to check across the configuration and state across a large wide variety of networks. And for example, maybe you run into a problem before you're doing these checks, before you have like a forward networks in place. And you see that NTP is out of sync. Well, that wreaks havoc across all logging and other types of systems, but it's also one of those core things you have to check if you're doing STIG compliance or any kind of uh, inspections that are out there. Maybe you fix that, but have you been able to go out and look across the network for any other type of configuration issues that are out there? Or more importantly, things that are driven by state that have been intractable, almost impossible to solve problems, such as having a route leak between a VRF. Imagine going into each and every device in your network that has a multiple VRFs on it and comparing and contrasting the route tables across all of them. These are problems that our query engine makes simple, easy to solve, and allows you to kind of root those things out. In fact, we have hundreds of those checks included. It's almost like a crowdsourcing of good ideas, only also from the security side, but also from the operational side. And we have customers that are driving that with what used to be a yearly inspection where they would gear up for the holiday season run all these checks, make sure their network's compliance, freeze the network through the holiday season. And then as soon as you come out, you have such pent up demand for change that you drift instantly away from where you were compliance. And now they're able to do that on a daily basis and ensure that they have everything running as they like. And last but not least is threat hunting. We're gonna show this part in the demo, but it's a blast radius of a host. It's that lateral movement of a host and what it's able to access. So you can simply type in any, any host, look at any range of networks, whether those are RFC 1918, all the way up to the default route and consider the, all the possible places that host could communicate to. Give you a summary where that host is, what it's connected to, where it's at on the VLANs and default gateways, but a tabular listing of all the places enumerated that it could communicate to. And we do that at any point in time. So you don't have to look at the network in its current state three months after you made it, were made aware of some possible malware that was in the network. You can go back in time, see exactly what that host could have communicated with on day zero. All right. I think we're going to drive through a demo, um, give you a quick background. Uh, when you're, you know, what, when we're looking at the platform, what it is you're, what you're looking at, we're going to cover use case one, which is the large site, and we'll, we'll talk about blast radius in the context of that. Um, use case two and three, where we have a satellite office that is uh, communicating to the headquarters, and is it going through the policy enforcement point, or is it going around? And then we'll look at uh, use cases four and five, co client connectivity accessing into the cloud and see what is what is possible. 
So with that, I will pull up here on the Forward Networks platform. Uh, a simple browser-based access to it. You don't have to have any agents on the systems, uh, on those network elements, those layers two through four devices for us to collect on them. And you don't have to have any software installed on your systems in order to access, access the application. We break, we break this down in, in terms of networks. You can create sub-networks, smaller groups of devices, if you wanted to for specific, you know, specific analysis, uh, such as you're in, very interested in a change. Or you can merge networks across administrative boundaries, even classification boundaries. And how we do that is because when we take this point in time snapshot, it's really just a collection of the show commands that we've gathered from the devices, zipped up together, easily to move across and through cross domain solutions. As Rich said, we rehydrate it and we can rehydrate that on any of these four networks instances. One of the byproducts of having a snapshot is you get a topology diagram. This is by location. You're able to drill into any of these locations and see what the network diagram would look like, even see how it connects externally to other, other sites and locations. And because we have these point in time copies of the network, we're able to answer some pretty key questions. One of the first one we almost always get is, you know, what's changed in the network? We're able to pick any two point in time and pull up a holistic view of all the possible changes that have occurred in the network. Now we'll give you the configs. We'll also give you the state information that's changed. Sometimes those are derived from the configs and other times those are from the back hose that attack fiber cables. But the reason we get this question is what's changed is over here. People wanna know, is anything down? Do I have an outage? What mission critical connectivity am I worried about restoring now or what door got left open. And we can instantly pull up and drill into that and see what was passing before and what's failed after. Where do I need to worry about right now because of between these two points in times, what has changed in my security, my security posture. Now I'll take a brief detour over here to uh, the vulnerability assessment. What this is, is a listing of the CVEs and the devices that are possibly impacted by those. And we can drill into one of them here and see that there are 16 devices that are, have a critical vulnerability related to LLDP. I can pull up that list. Now you're lucky as a network team, if the vulnerability team comes to you and says, hey, can you investigate this vulnerability? You're lucky you get that list of 16 devices because that at least narrows the scope instead of having to log into all devices of that particular vendor and try to root out that, that uh, CVE, whether you actually are impacted or not. And that's where Network Query Engine can help out. We're able to drill into Network Query Engine, have a query built around that, and then execute that check and see that, well, you know, bad day for us, right? We have all 16 to fix, but at least I know chapter and verse what exactly I would need to change if I wanted to, to make the change here at the, at the uh, configuration level, or as we mentioned before, the 16 devices, if those are the ones I would need to upgrade. So if we come back here to the, to the search, search tab, uh, we're gonna drill in here to this, our large site, our Atlanta uh, big office, and we're gonna look at it from the terms of a blast radius, right? One of these hosts here, somewhere in here, uh, is possibly communicating, uh, has potential malware on it or something of the sort, right? I wanna investigate. I'm able to type in that IP address here. I can, I can change the subnets as I, as I see fit. And click, and click on the search. And I've brought to this host tab right here, a summary. I know exactly, because it's a VM, I know exactly the name of that VM. I know exactly where it's connected. I have a VLAN. I can look at the gateway. All of these sets of information here are clickable. I can go drill into those. But over here in the reachability is that enumerated list of all the possible places that host can communicate to. Now, maybe one of these ports I'm interested in kind of looking into a little bit more because I've deployed a wide array of sensors in the network. I want to know if those sensors would pick up this traffic. And so I can go into those sensors, right? And look for it and see if there's actually a problem there or not, right? So I can go in and I can click in, I can view that sample path. Now I'll show you what it is you're looking at here with the sample path. This is a query up here. It's kind of a Google-like search for your network in terms of paths. And I can go through and I can see hop by hop, the subway stop diagram of exactly 
where these these hosts are, how this traffic path would be. I also get a visual representation of it on my right. And I can drill into one of these hop by hop diagrams and see what interfaces is coming in, what interface is going out. I can click in and see additional details about that. And then if seeing is believing, if you're from the Missouri state, you're able to drill in and see the device state exactly what caused that behavior. And it's this type of information right here is what makes doing a blast radius or doing these path searches very difficult to get to in seconds by your network operations teams. Because they have to translate this vendor specific syntax that you see right there, find it out of these 1400 lines, sometimes thousands of lines, translate that into something that's common sense, right? I can, I can understand what it is going on here and do that for each and every device. And then to have to do that in a blast radius sense across each and every possible port, protocol, and IP address. Now, we were over here, we were looking at this specific path, and I, I mentioned something about, you know, is this going through any of my monitors? Well, like Google like search fashion, right? I can, I can pick that up, I can type in here, is it going through one of my monitored interfaces? And it looks like I'm not. So that's, that's okay, because now I can, I can remove that. And again, I have a listing of exactly what interfaces I would need if I wanted to deploy any kind of sensor that's out there. So we'll go back and we'll look now at use case number two, which is my San Jose office communicating across the WAN into my large office at Atlanta. It's use case two and three-ish. And I've built an intent check. And I, that intent check here I'm looking for is an isolation check, which is essentially, I don't want to see any path between Atlanta and San Jose that skips over my PEP. And I can drill into that, I can see I'm, I'm failing now. And I can drill into that. So we'll look at the, the syntax of this language here while it's pulling up. We have through any of my core devices in Atlanta, represented by a device group. I have through any number of access layer switches that are out there in San Jose, bypassing my policy enforcement points in Atlanta, namely the firewalls that I'm running here, and bypassing any of my firewalls that I have in San Jose. And this key part right here is that traffic being delivered. I'm not necessarily interested in a whole space of packets that are getting dropped per se. This, is, this means that traffic has gone through both sides, those two locations, and bypassing my policy enforcement points and actually got delivered. And I can see a representation of a couple of these paths. And if you really want to try to drill into it, I can come in and I can see a sample packet just to see what the header space would look like. And that's where the secret sauce comes in is that we're looking at the header space through a series of mathematical transformations. Long story short, it gives you an ability to ask these kind of open-ended questions of the network to see what is possible. Is it possible to bypass my policy and get around those policy enforcement points. And last but not least, we'll, we're gonna address uh, use cases four and five. And that is where I have a host that's accessing something coming into the, into the cloud. And so for that, you know, we don't know necessarily where that host is. The host could be from anywhere on the internet, right? So we can just simply say, you know, we're, we're coming from the internet. And just by typing that, I have a, a brought into a list of outcomes. Some are delivered, some are dropped. I'm able to kind of start to see what range of IP sources, destination protocols, and whatnot that would make these this drill in even further. But I can, again, ask the simple question is what traffic gets delivered? And I can click into my AWS environment to see that the nice hop by hop kind of analysis. But we're, we're counting for any possible packet coming from the internet. So think of it as I plugged in a port scanner or a pen test into AWS, into your VPC and look through and said, all right, well, how can I get through the internet gateway? What are all the possible ways I could map through that? I can get through security groups. I can get through load balancers that may be up there and even more security groups. In other words, I've enumerated all the possible ways that traffic could get in. All right, let me return back to our architecture slides. And let me just one second. 
Yeah. Hey, Scott, real quick yeah. question inbound. Um, how do we handle, you know, devices that we don't have connectivity to or, or access to? There's a, we have a wide variety of ways we could do that. So this is essentially like a synthetic device where we, where it's necessary. So in this case here, we don't actually access anything in the internet. So we can treat the internet as a, a synthetic device where it would have a use public IP space for layer three VPNs, your traditional, I outsource my WAN transport connectivity to a service provider, for example. We can look at the BGP advertisements on the inbound and outbound and infer how the traffic would flow through those. Uh, same way with like layer two VPNs where you may have like a metro area, metro area network. All right. So back over here to, the, to our architecture. Yeah, so again, in, in, in summary, we've developed, and you can go ahead and build this out again. We're, we are trying to solve for the left-hand side of the slide. We built this mathematical model, this digital twin of the network. And then we've developed applications to consume that model, right? Whether it's the Google like search to figure out where something lives, uh, verifying that, that things are up. Again, something for mean time to resolution. Differential, right? That's really important in terms of, of how have things changed. Finally, and without selling futures, you know, our predict capability right now is a sandbox for users to be able to make changes to the NAT ACL firewall rule set and see how things will be effective. We, of course, are heading towards the realm of, of BGP route predict, but that is a very difficult problem to, to solve. So it's, it's going to take some time there. Scott, anything you want to add to this? I think the, the key thing is that we have that ability to verify what's, what's in the network. You can have a look at search and see what's currently allowed in the network. You can consider that your current state of trust that you have in your network. And then by instantiating the rules in Forward Networks platform, which you already have a wealth of, if you think about the ATO and the risk management framework, an ability to now to come in and say, verify that. So instead of waiting, filling out all that paperwork, finally getting to the CISO, the CISO looks at that and says, well, how do I know that the network is actually going to enforce what it is that application needs and what it is that application should not have any access to? If the wait months for that decision to be made and we're able to tell them right then, they can check it out right before they actually put their name on the line. All right. Um, I think we were. I think we were obliged to uh, also kind of show a little bit about the architecture, <laughs> um, and so with that, uh, forward networks can deploy as a single node, where we we have all the elements on the one. Uh, it can be deployed as an OBA, and then of course, as you kind of look at it, when when you have multiple um, networks you're collecting on, maybe large scale networks, and because we we just we license purely by by uh, network devices that we want a lot of users on there, we are able to scale out in a, in a cluster-like model. Uh, the app server is what the, the kind of the front end to that collector is what goes out and gets the information from devices. The uh, compute workers, those are those workers that uh, process the snapshots more or less. And then those put the data into these derived databases. So that's what we highly index that. And the search workers handle all of the user requests and API requests. You're able to isolate these on different nodes if you need to scale in particular. So if you're you know, kind of resource limited on a, on a particular hardware, you know, right? So you don't have as much RAM as you'd, as you'd like. So what I mean by that is, you know, for a thousand devices or less, we were looking at one one VM essentially, right? And as you get up above, we've, we've run one VM for up to 15,000 devices before, but as you start to get a lot of users on it, you know, of course we want to recommend that you have some type of cluster, some type of ability to scale out. And then even our largest customers not looking at a very heavy I lift. I went all the way up. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely thrown into that also. We've got a lot of customers looking at merging their snapshots. Right? In the case of, of DHS, you've got multiple different components inside of there. Also partner organizations or, or partner networks in the critical infrastructure realm, you know, being able to merge networks and see across th them in terms of the shared services, they might, you know, you might have an application running somewhere that a multitude of, of components access, right? Well, all of a sudden then there's a need to really see how that all of that, those sewer systems, forgive me, will connect together. So we have the ability to, 
you know, you get into the, just the tens of thousands of network devices. And of course, we are at scale with this. Um, largest customer is, is up over 45K. All right. And with uh, that, do we have any, uh, Rich, we have lots of questions out there or anything? Yeah, like I think we uh, we definitely cleaned up here on a Friday night doubleheader pretty pretty quickly here. Um, questions, item I noticed, uh, SNM, I hope that answered the question uh, around um, uh, disconnected devices or access to. Other questions we can field or items of interest. And if you don't want to vocalize them, you can utilize the chat to ask. And I'll take that as a Friday. <laughs> yeah. All right. We love Fridays. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. And, uh, and yeah, thank uh, you for the opportunity. Thank you. And I'm going to hit stop record.